Good morning. Good morning. Ah, don't you just love the spring rain? Yeah, thank you, Earth. Yes. Yay, I feel that way too. We had some fun music for you this morning. Welcome to the Grants Pass Center for Spiritual Living. We are Chantress. Um, Lauren is getting us all set up for our music this morning. We have a couple of beautiful, um, what, do you, what would you call them? We're calling in some chants. Chance. And then this first one is the first one or the Joy. second one? It's the, well, they both are, but joined together is the first one. Yes. So they're both Chantress. And then the second one is going to be calling in the directions, but we'll talk more about yes. that. Yes, okay. So we'll get the words up here. Um, because this is for you to sing too. But and this chant. first time, we'll just do it so you can kind of hear it and then you can join us, okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> deep breath ah now that we're joined together we're going to um, get ourselves kind of focused and grounded into this um, service we're going to call in the spirit of the wind and the spirit of the rain the spirit of the sun and the directions all around us so I just invite you to um, maybe even close your eyes once you get the song and let yourself be really centered in it We're going to do this first slide a couple times. We'll introduce it once. Spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the wind, carry me home. Spirit 
spirit of the wind, carry me home to myself. And again, spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the wind, carry me home. Spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the sun, spirit of the sun, carry me. Spirit of the sun, carry me home. Spirit of the sun, carry me home to myself. The earth, spirit of the earth, carry me. Spirit of the earth. River. Spirit of the river, carry me. Spirit of the river, carry me home. Spirit of the river, carry me home to Spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the wind, carry me home. Spirit of the wind, carry me home to myself. Spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the wind, carry me. Spirit of the wind, carry me home to myself. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Grants Pass Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Steve Van Meter, your senior minister. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you here this morning. I know you have a lot of different places you could be, you know, on a rainy day, you know, still laying in bed by the fire. But you found yourself here, and we appreciate you making the effort to get yourself here. Sit back, relax. We have a wonderful program for you. It's going to be about four hours, so I hope you're ready for that. Well, we're going to start with what we start every Sunday with, which is our vision mission statement up on the screen that says, we are an open, loving, spiritual community dedicated to evolving consciousness through teaching spiritual principles. We are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a teaching chapter. We have classes constantly going on. So, uh, and we have a bunch of stuff going on. And I'll just say before I start the announcements that we have uh, clipboards on the back counter there. So anything that is, is mentioned here, you can sign up back there. But I wanna start with a bookstore announcement. So I'm gonna bring our bookstore manager, also um, <laughs> uh, Roxanne Zirkel. Uh, also our, um, She's also on our board, and she's this, our secretary of the board. So let's, uh, let's hear it for Roxanne Zirkel. Well, thank you, and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Roxanne Zirkel, and I am Marie. Where's the Marie at? There's Marie. Um, are at the bookstore um, after the services. We're open, and we're open usually until about noonish give or take. Um, so I want to tell you what's going on with the bookstore. Right now, our weekly book that's on sale is It's Never Too Late to Begin Again. That's the book, and it's 20% off, which is nice. And also, Marie puts in a really good um, blurb in the weekly email about our book. So you can read about it more there before the Sunday service. We're also having a raffle for the month of April. Um, this raise funds for the center. I think it's for the week. 
help with the rep center. And this is the book. It's the Toltec Art of Life and Death by Don Miguel Ruiz. Beautiful book, hardcover, lovely cover. Uh, Maria put a nice protective laminate on it for you. Um, tickets are one for a dollar, six for five dollars. And the raffle will be on April 28th or drawing and you don't have to be present to win. And something new we have um, from Mary Wirtz, we have sun catchers or wool hanging beads with a crystal at the end. They're beautiful, they're absolutely beautiful. And um, they're for sale. And so we take cash or card um, and you come in the stage, come and look at them. We don't have them hanging yet, but we're working on that. So you can see them with the light behind them, which is the way the crystals should be seen. So anyway, that's the bookstore. Thank you. Also, our guest speaker, Rev. Stephanie, will have some books um, on sale in the back afterwards. So um, stay tuned. There's all sorts of book stuff going on. So, And I was just handed this, a book fair to remember. Friday, April 19th from 5 to 8, and um, it's at the Grants Pass Museum of Art. And uh, I think we have four of our congregants who are authors uh, going to be uh, showcased in this. Uh, let's see, it's Karen Tate. Is Karen? Karen Tate, yes. And um, Ann Southcombe, our resident animal healer. Also, um, Vajra. Bajama and uh, Nancy Yonnelly, who's not here, but one of our founding members is uh, got some of her poetry in a book. And so please come support your center by by doing that. Also, we uh, we gave um, we had three boxes of food that were given to you can and we it was uh, equal to a hundred dollars worth of food for the community of the homeless community that uh, we love to support in getting unhomeless right so uh your donations are at the door please keep bringing them in so we have our regular announcements now wow you get handed all this stuff when you come up here okay your center needs your assistance um we know that you have a talent other than just tithing we know that you can come and help us to facilitate this wonderful place that we have. And we have so many things that you can do to assist us. Um, kitchen Angels, uh, see Paula Peterson. If you wanna help in the kitchen, I mean, if that's your thing, God bless you, that's not mine. <laughs> Spiritual Gardeners, look at our grounds. They were here yesterday for hours cleaning and mowing and cutting and i just got the you know the the lawnmower fixed it had been sitting all winter and we couldn't start it so i got it all took it into the shop and got it fixed you know you can't cut the lawn without a mower building and grounds you can contact me uh, i would love for you to help us with building and grounds uh, the front door is going to be painted as soon as the rain stops you've all seen the paint falling off the front door and we're putting a new roof on and uh, just, again, we raised at the Re Rock and Roll with Reverend Steve Knight, we raised f over $1,500. Thanks to your generous donation. And stay tuned. We're going to do another one. <laughs> uh, let's see. The book raffle has been announced. Soul Collage was yesterday. And there was, uh, I think there was seven, uh, seven to nine people here. And all those donation or part of that donation goes right back into your center. And the next one will be May 11th. Is that right? May 11th? Okay, great. So come and do soul collage. Uh, there is an afternoon exploration walk at Pacifica. Sunday, April 21st from 1215 to 5 p.m. Uh, it's also a fundraiser for our center. Um, and there's details in the back. I won't read it all now but you can bring your dog and that's what's important to me. I will be going with Luna, Luna and me and my dog will be there. So <laughs> on leash, of course. And our community forum, if you've got questions, <laughs> we've got answers and more questions. So if you would like to come on April 28th after the service, starting at noon, 
your board will be up here answering questions and um, just here for you to converse with. So please come learn more about our center. And bringing forth, <coughs> excuse me, bringing forth soul consciousness book study starting Thursday, May 2nd from 3.30 to 5, Deborah Perdue. She's doing that again. Here she goes. <laughs> Show up and have some fun with her. And there's a whole thing on this. And basically, I'll just tell you that it is uh, a love offering basis. Suggested donation is $20 per class. Starts Thursday, May 2nd, 3.30 to 5 for seven weeks. They'll be studying the book and meditating, doing experiential exercises, journaling. Um, it's a whole thing about Akashic Records, if you know what that is. If you don't, you really need to come and find out what that's all about because there's some hidden wisdom right under your fingertips. So. Our third annual fun fair, Saturday, June 1st from 11 to 4 p.m. Um, this is our biggest bash of the year. Uh, it has been rumored that my band is going to play, but we're still going to, you know, if we get enough turnout, you know, if we get people signing up, we don't have the sign up sheet up yes, yet, but it's coming. And that's June 1st. Um, and the theme this year is discovery. So if you have something that you would like to sell at our fun fair, there are applications in the back. Please pick one up. And that does it for those announcements. And now I have our regular announcement. I know, stay tuned. Flowers today are from Deborah Perdue. Thank you, Deborah. Is there anybody that's here for the first time? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're here. Um, if somebody could grab a couple of those welcome packs and get them, it, it, Wendy, could you grab those and get, get, I think we have one over here and we've got stuff up here. Okay. Um, is it okay to call you Rev Steph? Okay, Rev Steph. You can call her Rev Steph. Okay. Uh, cell phones. Do you have one? Put it on phase, stun, whatever. <laughs> Put it on vibrate or turn it off for a few minutes so that we can have a peaceful experience here together. And next, we will all stand as uh, Lauren leaves, leads us as we sing, We Are One. We are one. We are one. I am you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Deborah Perdue, a licensed practitioner here, and it's my honor to be here up on stage as the pulpit practitioner today. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living. Please join me in reading the gratitude on the screen. With gratitude and gentleness, I allow love and acceptance into my heart for all interactions with people, including myself. What is a practitioner and what, we, what do we do? There's a gold sheet in the back of your, the seat backs. 
and also on the practitioner table, which tells you all about what we do. Basically, we serve the center in prayer and teach classes and even the music. Some of the practitioners are mu music practitioners here. That's their prayer ministry. And so um, find out what we do. Um, contact us if you would like a short prayer after the service. And Janet Murray is our practitioner in the back, our table practitioner holding the high watch, holding love and peace and joy in her heart for all and sending it to everyone. And um, if you are a practitioner who can pray after the service, will you raise your hand? We have quite a few here. And so see Janet and she'll either direct you to someone else or have to pray with you. And also, you can do um, prayers online at the grantspasscsl.org, or if you're here, you can request a affirmative prayer, fill out this, and either put it in the box at the back table or in the offertory basket, and we pray for you for a week or more if you want us to ask, if you want it to go longer than a week. And the blue sheets that are which I don't think there's one here, are for um, demonstrations. And demonstration, thanks, Ralph. Demonstrations are when your prayer is answered, as we know it will be. Um, let us know. We'd love to hear about your demonstrations. Let's read the prayer together that's on the screen. I am kind, loving, and gentle with myself and everyone I encounter. From this place, I make clear decisions going forward. So then we're gonna sing I Am Loved and you can remain seated for this one. to contemplate and then we'll go into a few minutes of silence and I'll also do an invocation. I might need reading glasses. Does someone have them? They're not up here and I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this month we are focusing on giant gentleness and learning about embodying this more in our lives. Before I read a wonderful passage on gentleness as our superpower from our wonderful Science of Mind magazine, I want to admit that I lose my gentleness sometimes when triggered. Most often this happens with my contrarian husband. <laughs> it's true, he really knows how to push my buttons and I can be fierce and combative when that happens. My responses are not gentle. Also, when I feel not understood or validated in what I am seeking, this happens, for example, with waiting on hold for two hours on the phone to get a message across to a company. Again, when I finally talk to a person, I am not my usual gentle self. I feel and sound harsh and brittle instead. And I'm honestly not always gentle with my own self, too, if I do something I wish I wouldn't. So my spiritual job is one that keeps coming up. In the first two cases, don't take things personal, personally is my mantra, and I strive to remain peaceful, calm, and the gentle being I am, even when pushed. Here's the reading. Gentleness as our superpower. 
as we develop greater harmony with spirit, our gentleness becomes our superpower. Being gentle with ourselves, we align more with who we truly are. In time, we may begin to notice that what other people say and do no longer triggers us or controls our behaviors the way it might have in the past. Becoming gentler with ourselves, we are more, more likely to let go of old grievances, worry less, and not spend so much time rushing through life fueled by anxiety. Insta instead, we relax our bodies, calm our thinking, and connect with our hearts. It is there in our own heart space that we find our gentle strength and learn, like the old growth trees, to stand sturdy in the winds of outer change chaos and turmoil. We learn to be self-governing, discerning how we want to be in the world and what is ours to do. What's more, we learn to live in the present moment, not in worrying about the past or fearing the future. Storms may swirl around us, but we are stable, serene, and mighty within. Entering the still giant expanse of our heart space, we are better able to offer compassion, kindness, and gentleness to ourselves, to others and to the world at large. And that's by Diane J. Ensign. So let's go into the silence and really contemplate gentleness and love. And I invite you to come bring your consciousness back to this room to open your eyes when you're ready and to be here now. And I am speaking my word for the Grants Pass Center for Spiritual Living today, knowing that it is divinely guided, divinely supported, always a blessing to the world. And I know that this time together with Rev. Steph speaking and the beautiful music is absolutely absolutely guided by spirit, by God. And there's love and peace and joy and harmony throughout this room stretching into the outer world too. And I know that it's good and very good, and so it is. So it is. <laughs> the dog <laughs> affirms it. <laughs> so um, it's time for some more special music. And then Rev. Steph, and I'm going to come back and introduce her after that, but the music first. This is a new song for me, Reverend Steph. Send it to me, and it's very simple and beautiful. We can just take in these words. See me beautiful. Look for the best in me. That's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me a chance could you find a way to see me shining through in everything I do and see me Like a 
starry summer night, snow-covered winter's day. Yes, everybody is beautiful in their own way. Under God's heaven, the world's gonna find a way. There is none so blind. and Paula. Beautiful. So it's my pleasure and delight to welcome Reverend Stephanie Clark. She likes being called Rev Steph, she said. She's known as the irreverent reverend because she loves to expose the religious and cultural ta taboos around sexuality. Having trained for the ministry under Reverend Michael Beckwith at Agape in Los Angeles, Rev Steph returned to her adopted country, South Africa, and in 2000, she founded Soul Home, a multiracial ministry dedicated to healing the wounds of apartheid. On a spiritual journey to Egypt in 2019 with Reverend Michael Beckwith, she met her now husband, Reverend Jim Hatton, in the Great Pyramid of Cairo and made an honest man, man of him in April of 2021. <laughs> Since January 2023, Rev. Steph has been serving as a staff minister at CSL Rogue Valley in Medford. She is an international speaker, a spiritual coach, and an accomplished author. Two of her books, as Rev. Steve mentioned, will be available for sale after the service today. The first one is The Misadventures of an Irreverent Reverend, a Spirited Guide for Rebels and Renegades. And the second one, the second sex goddess debunking the mythology of God and sex. Her latest book, Miracle Making, How to Pray the Affirmative Way in Five Easy Steps, will be available on Amazon soon. So please join me in welcoming Rev. Steph to our Grant Cast Center for Spiritual Living. Thank you for the lovely welcome. Good morning, everybody. So, um, first of all, thank you for the lovely welcome. And as you know, the theme this month is giant gentleness. And I was going to ask you to be gentle with me because it's my first time. 
but I've had a lovely welcome here. Thank you very much. And honestly, Reverend Stephen, I'm very moved by the love in this place. Really feel the bonds of community here and how, how everybody just loves this place and loves to serve. It's really palpable. And thank you for what you've created here. Um, so the topic today is the other in love. And I intend to share with you how gentleness with yourself, gentleness with myself, will lead to being gentle with the other to the point that we arrive at the state of consciousness where there is no other. That's the point, that we really embody and know the oneness that is the truth of our being. And I'm going to start with a story about a friend of mine. Her name is Jo Berry, and I met her at university in Bradford in Northern England. I was there from 1977 to 1981. We weren't close friends, but we knew each other. Um, and at that time, the war was raging between Britain and Northern Ireland. And I don't know how much of that was reported in America, but it was very present for us in the UK. We were in the news, we were all often reading about the bombs that were being planted on trains and the bombs that were being set to blow up politicians. And because I'm irreverent and because I'm a rebel, I was dating a man who was a sympathizer with the Irish Republican Army. So there we were, we were a Romeo and Juliet couple where we should not have been together and it was dangerous for both of us to actually be together. Um, and uh, so, uh, just beginning to feel the energy of that time and the, the intensity of the love that we shared but also the massive stress that we were under all the time with fear of either of us being pulled in by the police. Um, so, um, Joe, at that point, as far as I know, wasn't involved with any, any Northern Ireland politics. But in 1984, her, her father, Sir Anthony Berry, was uh, murdered. And he was at the Conservative Party conference in a hotel in Brighton, in the south of England. And a man called Pat McGee from the Irish Republican Ar Army, the IRA, had planted a bomb in this hotel and it was set to blow up Margaret Thatcher, who was our conservative prime minister at the time. It missed Margaret Thatcher, but it hit Joe Berry's dad, Sir Anthony Berry. So Joe, of course, was in massive shock. Her life was devastated. Um, two days later, her father was buried at uh, St. James's Church in Piccadilly, and she created a relationship with the people at St. James's Church they had a wonderful alternative program with lots of different speakers coming in from America. And I was volunteering there at the alternative bookstore. So I reconnected with Jo, sadly, after the death of her father. Jo decided that she was going to understand why someone would want to murder another human being. She wanted to understand what was going on for the people in Northern Ireland that they would see fit to commit an act of violence. And so after her father's death, she traveled back and forth to Northern Ireland regularly and began to work with both the victims and the combatants on both sides. What, I mean, what an amazing being to turn the grief around and make it into a contribution to peace and reconciliation. So uh, Patrick McGee, the man who committed the murder, who planted the bomb, was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Um, but he got out early by a, by a peace agreement in 1998, so he actually only served about 15 years. And in 2000, Joe and Patrick McGee met one another. So I want to tell you, uh, in Joe's own words, uh, what, what it was like for her, because many articles were being published about her at the time, and this is from the UK newspaper, The Guardian. I wanted to meet Patrick, to put a face to the enemy, and see him as a real human being. At our first meeting, I was terrified, but I wanted to acknowledge the courage it had taken him to meet me. We talked with extraordinary intensity. I shared a lot about my father, while Patrick told me some of his story. An inner shift is required to hear the story of the enemy. For me, the question is always about whether I can let go of my need to blame and open my heart enough to hear Patrick's story. 
and understand his motivations. The truth is that sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. It's a journey and it's a choice, which means it's not all sorted and put away in a box. Over the past two and a half years of getting to know Patrick, I feel I've been recovering some of the humanity I lost when that bomb went off. Patrick is also on a journey to recover his humanity. I know that he sometimes finds it hard to live with the knowledge that he cares for the daughter of someone he killed through his terrorist actions. Perhaps more than anything, I've realized that no matter which side of the conflict you're on, had we all lived each other's lives, we could all have done what the other did. That's the important thing to recognize. If I, you and I had been born in those circumstances with that upbringing, those cultural influences, that political situation, all of that going on, we would have done the same, possibly. So, um, so Joe, Joe is an outstanding human being, but you and I, we all have that same capacity. But how are we gonna activate that? How are we gonna be so gentle that we can meet with the person who murdered our beloved father to, to get to that level of gentleness? I want to share with you a little about my science of mind journey. Um, so I, uh, I went to, si to South Africa in 1985. And um, as you can hear from my accent, I grew up in England, and, but my mother emigrated and I went to visit her. And at the time, apartheid was raging in South Africa. So the blacks and the whites were separated, but not like here, it was actually in a way worse because the separation between blacks and whites was legalized through the, through the laws of the land. Um, at least in America, you didn't have it legalized. Um, so I got to South Africa and I was on a spiritual journey, which I mainly was um, practicing in bars. I was looking for the spirit. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, no, I definitely had a strong spiritual yearning. And in South Africa, I found the first church of religious science. And for those of you who haven't been around that long, that was the old name for Centers for Spiritual Living. And I, as soon as I walked into a lecture that my uh, minister was giving about the Sermon on the Mount, I thought, this is it, I'm home. Did you have that experience when you, when you got to CSL? Like, oh, this is the message that my soul wanted to hear. So I, as I said, I was only there for two months and I thought that I would be so disgusted by the apartheid situation that I would just, after two months, I would, I would check it out and then I would go back to Europe. Um, but I had um, a calling, I had a, a, a voice within that said, I've brought you here, now it's time to get on with the work. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I did know that I wanted to study the science of mind. And secretly, I really wanted to bring down apartheid single-handed. <laughs> I have a slight uh, rescue complex. <laughs> um, anyway, so I joined the Science of Mind course, and at, in those days, it was a year. It was a year. Can you imagine? This, now it's five weeks or six weeks or something, but then it was a year. You had to be serious, and you had to be committed. I ripped up my round-trip ticket back to Europe, and I decided I'm going to find a way to stay in this country. And I'm so glad that my minister, Reverend Gladys, was such a wise woman because with my missionary zeal and my rescuing complex, I really wanted to go and work in the black township for the black newspapers and start to bring down the system through the power of the pen. I thought that would be my, my way forward as a, as a very um, sophisticated rebel. Anyway, um, she said to me, Stephanie, if you try and work in the black townships, you're probably going to end up in jail or dead. So... She said, rather um, do what you can here and stay safe, but learn to change your consciousness because it's only through changing your consciousness that you can really make a change in society. Um, she knew that I was a rebel without a clue. <laughs> so, um, so I studied science of mind and there were three important things that I wanna share with you today that I learned from Reverend Gladys in those early years. Um, the first one is, The first one is all life is consciousness. All life is consciousness. And for me, that means that nothing happens on earth in the physical plane without it first being an idea or concept or a thought in divine mind. 
And the good news here is this means we can change our lives because we can change our minds. We're not fighting up against the battle of irrevocable or unchangeable consequences outside of ourselves. Second one is our concept of God determines everything that happens in our life. What are you and I identified with? Do you feel like a victim with a distant, mostly male, punishing God figure, an authority in the sky? Because that's how we were raised if we were raised in Christianity, right? There's a male God somewhere out there in the sky with a big stick and a, and a record book. Put your hands up if you're relating to this in any way whatsoever. Okay, yeah. So that, that's an old concept of God that we really have to get free of in order to be able to choose our own reality. And then... Um, so, but you might, you might be feeling like a victim, you might be feeling like um, you are one with the divine intelligence of the universe and everything is beautiful and life is wonderful every day because you're so connected with your spirit. Or somewhere in between, or back and forth. I mean, that's the experience for most of us. Sometimes we're in the pits and sometimes we're very, feeling very enlightened. And the journey is to become more, spend more and more time in that enlightened state and less and less time in the victim state. And the, then the main tenet of the science, science of mind teaching is that there's only one mind and one power. And I am that individualized, and you are that individualized. So at the level of the non-physical, we are all connected. And so when we sing, we are one, it doesn't look like we're one on the physical level because we're living obviously in separate bodies. But at the level of the infinite, at the level of the non-physical, we are one, we are connected. And nothing can break that. Nothing can break that. There is no other power that could ever break that connection. So our purpose on earth is to embody that oneness. And how are we going to embody it? Well, being gentle with ourselves and being gentle with one another is part of the journey. But how are we going to do that? How are we going to be gentle with one another? I have been a self-punishing person for a long time. Give me another hand up if you've been a self-punishing person. Yeah, why, why, why do we punish ourselves? Why do we punish ourselves? So for me, the first step is learning to understand that that punishing pattern is not your fault. It's not my fault. It's, not, it's what we were born into. So most of it comes from our parents, our culture, our upbringing, maybe the religious upbringing of our childhood. And our parents had a job. And that job, that biological imperative, was to raise us until we got to age 18, until we were independent and could live our own lives and support ourselves, feed ourselves, find shelter for ourselves, just like the animal kingdom. That was their job. That was their only job. And by the looks of it, in every case here, they did their job. Your parents did their job. They did it really well. They got you to 18, and for the, for the rest of the time, you've been supporting yourself. It wasn't their job to be your spiritual guru. <laughs> Maybe they were, maybe they were a very enlightened beings, but it wasn't, that wasn't their job. Their job was to raise you, that was the biological job. And not only raise you, but they had to raise you to survive on the earth plane. That was their only intention. You had to survive on the earth plane. The best way to survive on the earth plane is to be successful. And to be successful, they wanted you to be perfect. So guess what, if you weren't perfect, they probably criticized you. They probably judged you. They probably punished you. That's what happened in my experience anyway. So I, I grew up thinking, I've got to be perfect, but I'm not perfect, so I have to scold myself into perfection. Any relation? Yeah, okay, good. I can see some nodding heads. I'm just really love you to show me you know, like that. It's really nice. Thank you. I don't want to feel alone up here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so when we got to 18, uh, here we have all of this baggage, all of this wiring that says, I'm not good enough, oh, you stupid idiot, you know, you shouldn't have done it that way, you know, striving. Anyone here, here hear the message that you have to work hard to earn every penny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to struggle to survive. Yeah, we've got a load of baggage going on. And thankfully, we also have the science of mind. So... Our spiritual radar for truth knew that there was something more than that and brought us into this situation or into whatever situation we could be in that would help us to understand the spiritual truth of reality. So you know when you're with a little baby and the little baby is trying to walk, or maybe 18 months old, is trying to walk, when the baby falls, you don't say, oh, you stupid, you stupid idiot, you fell. 
get yourself up there. Stop being such a weak, weak-willed idiot. I mean, I have talked to myself that way. But you and I would not talk to a baby that way, would we? We would say, go for it. Well done. You're doing so well. It doesn't matter that you fell over. You'll pick yourself up. You'll do it again. And next time you'll be better. Wouldn't it be lovely if we talked to ourselves that way? Wouldn't it be lovely? Just really encouraging and gentle and affirming. And, but that's not how we were raised. So that's, this is our work now in Science of Mind. So the first step, understanding. So I wanted to share with you what, how I believe that critical voice got there. And it wasn't your fault. Second step, um, we need to activate our divine presence, our divine awareness. And we can activate it. We can set the intention. We need to consciously activate that divine presence so that we can catch that critical voice when it's running the show. Because if you can't, if you're not aware of it, it's really hard to change it. If it's just running its mouth off in your brain, <laughs> you can't really change it. So some of the ways that we can become aware of it are um, we can be do mindfulness, practice mindfulness. So we're kind of standing outside ourselves and observing and watching that critical voice, and then we can catch it before it really takes over. Um, another thing you can do is um, just set the intention. So you, you just have to set the intention that you're going to catch that voice in action, and even that will allow you to be more aware of it when it starts up. Um, and um, oh, yeah, a lovely quote from um, Nelson Mandela, who was the first democratic president of South Africa. Um, that he was freed from 27 years in prison as a political prisoner. And as he walked out of prison for the last time, because he had been set free, um, he said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I did not leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. Powerful, huh? Powerful. So you and I, if we don't leave that critical voice behind, it's imprisoning us, and we can't be all that we are here to be. The other way, if it's difficult to catch what's going on in your mind, because it's, it's habit, and you and I have, have gotten identified with habit. If it's difficult to catch it there, we can watch the mirror of our lives, so you can see how people treat you. If people invalidate you, if they don't listen to you, if you don't feel heard, if you don't feel gotten, if you don't feel seen, that's what's going on up here. It's nothing to do with them. They're the mirror. They're showing you what they, what they, they're showing you what you are thinking, what you are feeling, and they're just acting it out for you on your stage with the script that you have written. <laughs> That's a big one to swallow because it means we're totally responsible. <laughs> a little story about that. So. Uh, I'm a part-time minister at CSL Rogue Valley, but I also, during the week, I do a couple of days of substitute teaching, and I really love working in special ed. So I was in special ed with a seven-year-old a couple of weeks ago, and it was playtime, and we were out in the playground, and she wanted to climb the climbing frame and have me watch her. And you know when you're with kids, watch me, watch me. They just so want to be seen, and they want your loving adult attention. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll watch you. And I really had a great intention to watch her. But then I thought, well, I can check my phone while we're, <laughs> while we're on the break. And her, her back was to me as she climbed the climbing frame. And I was on my phone. And then she turned around. She said, you're not watching me. <laughs> I was busted. <laughs> I said, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm watching you now. And I put my phone away. But a seven-year-old had to remind me that I was not paying attention. Anyway, later that day, this is interesting how karma comes back so quickly. Later that day, I was uh, at my physical therapy session, and uh, my physical therapist was really busy, and, and she had to go and see another client. So she started me off with my exercises, and then she said, I'm going to hand you over to uh, my, my colleague. And, and this guy was a trainee, and really handsome, attractive man, and completely not present, completely not present. So I'm busy doing my exercises, and his job is to help me do them and make sure I'm doing them right so that I don't cause myself damage. So he was chatting to the other people in the center and, you know, just like checking himself out in the mirror. And um, he's not paying me attention. Oh, right, like that little girl on the climbing. <laughs> so anyway, so what's that about? My little child is crying out for attention, but I'm the one that can give it to her. So you and I try to get that thing that we're missing from other people. It doesn't ever work, doesn't ever happen. 
They don't want to give it, and it's not their job. They don't want to give you what you're, need, what you're needing to fix inside for yourself, and it's not their job. So if you ever try to manipulate someone to give them what you want, you'll find that they'll resist you. Anyone experience that? Yeah, yeah. You never listen to me. Well, I'm not listening to myself. That's it. That's the thing. There's no one else out there, remember? We're one in spirit. We're one in mind. So this is just another voice of myself that's on, seemingly on the outside, but really just mirroring back to me. How am I doing for time, Reverend Stephen? I'm good. I've got a lot to say. It's a minister's curse. Why don't you give us a stage and a microphone? <laughs> We're off. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, so it's getting some understanding of where this critical voice comes from, activating our divine conscious awareness so that we can catch the voice in action. And then the next thing is to self-soothe, to self-soothe, to be gentle with ourselves. Um, so in uh, 1999, I was um, studying at Agape with Reverend Michael Beckwith, and I had had my call to return to South Africa and start a multiracial ministry. And I met Marshall Rosenberg, who um, started the nonviolent communication practice and training. Anyone familiar with that? Oh, quite a few. That's nice, yeah. So Mike, uh, Marshall Rosenberg would come to Agape regularly and give uh, workshops. And he shared about a 10-day training that he was going to give for teachers, but other people were willing, to, were, um, uh, were allowed to come and join in. And I really wanted to be on that 10-day training because I figured that nonviolent communication would be the perfect tool to use when I got back to South Africa to encourage blacks and whites to start dialoguing together. So Nelson Mandela had come to power in 1994. And here I am in 1999 preparing to go back to South Africa. So we'd had a democratic country for five years, but nevertheless, there was still a lot of racial tension and conflict. And this is what, something that I wanted my ministry to address. Anyway, I was on the 10-day training, and uh, it was heaven on earth for 10 days. It was so wonderful that everything we did was about nonviolent communication. And when I say nonviolent, um, I don't mean communication without using arms or weapon or ammunition or physical violence. I don't mean that. I mean nonviolent as in from the heart, compassionate communication. And the Marshall's particular um, teaching method is to um, be able to express empathy towards ourselves and towards others. And the way in, the way to do that is to um, be respectful or be aware of each other's feelings and needs. So in the case of Pat McGee, the man who planted the bomb in the Brighton bombing, do you think he was feeling angry about the situation in Northern Ireland with the British occupation? Yeah, he was feeling angry. Do you think he was feeling, what? Ang powerless, yeah, I'm, not, I'm just checking myself out here. I'm thinking powerless, but is powerless really a feeling? Angry is definitely a feeling. Powerless, maybe not, but still. Um, the, the angry feelings are the indication that there's a major human need not being met. So his human need that wasn't being met could be something like freedom or autonomy. The Irish Republican Army were fighting to divorce themselves from Britain and have home rule. Um, so anyway, his, his strategy for getting that need met was to plant a bomb. Not a very effect, effective strategy. And Marshall Rosenberg's approach is that if people can connect in the heart, then they can develop strategies that everybody will get their needs met and everybody will be blessed by that. So after 10 days with Marshall and the group um, that was on the workshop and having compassionate communication at every, every minute of the day, so over breakfast, lunch and dinner, in the workshops, in the free time, it was the most beautiful thing to be in that compassionate environment. And then when it was over, I returned to Agape, and at that time I was teaching Practitioner One. And I realized I was a different person. I was so much more gentle with myself and so much more compassionate and so much more understanding. It really, it had, it had really helped me to rewire. And I stood up and in front of my students, I said, um, I've just got back from this training and it was on compassionate communication. And I can really see now how harsh I used to be with myself and how punishing I was with myself and therefore how punishing and harsh I was with you, my students. 
and I'm really sorry because I realize now it, it, it was just because I was so in, in, in blame and punishment of myself that that leaked out over, over you and um, they started to applaud. <laughs> it was so sweet because they had felt my edge, but no one could have said that. They just said, oh, Stephanie's really strict. You know, she's a really strict teacher. Yeah, I was a strict teacher and there's nothing wrong with that, but I had an edge because I, I, I wanted them to be successful and I wanted them to be perfect. And when they weren't perfect, remember we talked about parents wanting us to be perfect so that we'd be successful. If they weren't successful, if they weren't perfect, then I had to do something about that. So I had to you know, push them harder and I had to be even more strict with them. Anyway, obviously it doesn't work. It doesn't work to be strict and harsh and punishing. Uh, the other person who I'm, I love to learn from is um, Esther Hicks, who channels the entity Abraham. Anyone familiar with that? Uh, yeah, a lot of people here. It's so lovely in alignment. It's so well in alignment with science and mind teaching. So Esther talks about self-soothing as well. She said, if you're in a space where you're being critical of yourself, then um, if you get more critical, then you drive yourself deeper into the pit. But as soon as you catch it, if you can say to yourself, look how far you've come, you're really doing very well. Like, look at how, how is the glass half full rather than how is it half empty? So, oh, you're not doing that right, you stupid idiot. No, oh, no, I can see that you're really wanting to accomplish this. I can see that you're really wanting to gain mastery here. I can see that you're willing to experiment here. I can see that you're exploring and that you're really trying and that you're really wanting to expand. That's a much nicer way to be with ourselves, isn't it? And the other way to be, to self-soothe is, to um, remind yourself how much things are going well in your life, because they are, they are all the time. It's just a question of you and me focusing on that. So, and, and, and by focusing on what's going well in our lives, we're kind of taking the attention off the thing that we think is not working. And we're looking at things that are working. What's going well? Oh, I have a roof over my head, I have food to eat, I have money to spend, I have a lovely car, I have a lovely husband, I have a lovely home, I, oh, I've got so much. And that acknowledgement of how much you already have is instantly picked up by the law of attraction. And then what happens? You get more, you get more. So that what you focus on, you get more of. So you and I, when we take the focus off that critical voice and off the thing that we think is not right or not working or not perfect, and put it on something that is good, that is working, that is working really well, we get more of that. So that's how we self-soothe. And the last thing, if you haven't thought of it already, is prayer. Go and get prayer. If you're in a difficult position, it's, sometimes it's really hard to get out of it ourselves. And sometimes we just need help. We need someone to hold the space and to see who we really are, even when we have forgotten on a temporary basis. So I know you have a lot of wonderful practitioners here. So if you hear that critical voice and you can't seem to get out of that cycle, then pick up the phone, reach out for prayer, call someone who can hold the space with you, who isn't in that space, who can actually be there as a, as a clear reminder of who you really are. So just to um, wrap up now, so my, my friend Jo Berry, um, she, uh, just to complete this, she started something called the Forgiveness Project. And after she met Patrick in the year 2000, Patrick McGee, the man who planted the bomb, the two of them set up a partnership and they traveled all over the world and talking about peace and reconciliation. So she's been in the Middle East. Um, I saw her on Facebook yesterday and we have friends in common in the Middle East who are part of the Abrahamic reunion, the interfaith group in the Middle East. Um, she's been to Kosovo, so everywhere she goes, she speaks about the possibility of reconciliation, which is a wonderful thing, and I'm, I'm so proud to know her, and I'm so proud to be able to share the story of her today. So I'm going to leave you with something that's quite intense. Are you ready for it? Okay, just one sentence. It's a, a quote from Leo Buscaglia, who is a very famous uh, spiritual author. You remember him from the 70s and 80s? Yeah, he was very popular then. What love we've given will have forever. What love we fail to give will be lost for all eternity. Uh, I'll read it again. What love we've given will have forever. What love we fail to give will be lost for all eternity. Now's your time. Give your love. Thank you so much.
Let's hear it again for yeah. Reverend Steph. Thank you. Well, we're going to follow our teaching and do a little prayer work right now. So if you want to bring the lights down a little bit, let's just, uh, I invite you to bring to the forefront of your consciousness of what you believe the power is for you. You can call it Christ, Buddha, Allah, source energy, great spirit. I think we can agree that there is something animating you, something moving through and as who and what we are. And as such, we are unified in that field of all opportunity because there truly is only one of us here expressing as the multi-dimensional beings that each one of you is. So I invite you to bring to the forefront of your consciousness what you're working with right now. Be it a relationship situation or a creative expression, energy, or maybe it's abundance or health. But whatever it is, imagine it as completely neutralized right here and right now. That whatever is going on is really asking for your spiritual awareness and attention. Asking you to redirect that energy towards your belief in the power that created you. And as you gently move from whatever the situation was into your belief about eternality, you release the energy around whatever was going on and activate the healing energy of mind. And that healing energy is flowing through our beings, throwing, flowing through our body and our DNA and in the cells of our body, moving the right cells to the right places for that perfect healing and moving everything in consciousness that needs to be known for the complete resolution and healing of your situation. And just bask in that as the waves of healing flow over you. Natural gratitude comes forth. How good it is to know that something loves you so much that it has given you this thing called life and that you have refocused that energy back upon itself and are now one as the healing experience in your life. It is easy to be grateful, to be in bliss, happy without a reason to be happy just because you choose to be happy. No matter what's going on, this too shall pass. So we let go. We completely release this word into that living, loving law. For it is already done. As we affirm this together by saying, and so it is. we bring ourselves back into this room, into your bodies. Welcome home again. It's time for our affirmative prayer on our offertory. So if you'd like to put your hand on your heart and your gift and in your hand, it, if you're just giving your heart, that's enough today too. I celebrate my abundance today by sharing my wealth in divine circulation. I am open to receive great gifts of abundance, and so is. And now some music. This is another new song for me, um, and I found myself singing it throughout the entire week, even when I was in traffic 
and I realized what Reverend Steph said when I was impatient with the driver in front of me. I went from Zen to total, you know, <laughs> you dumbass, you know, in front of me. So I did really. I know none of nobody else has done that, but I then I realized that it was because I was not being gentle. I was pushing myself. I need to, I need to go here and do this and beyond, you know, and so I, it was all because I wasn't and I and this song just was like magic and you know, in a it's a great reminder. So say a prayer for our offertory this morning from the love of pure spiritual energy these tithes and gifts have been collected they're evidence of our faith our belief and our ability to manifest in this world of form and they do good work in the world blessing the giver and receiver and allowing this the grants past center for spiritual living to be open and available to those who are choosing to remember who they are, and even for those who may not know it yet. And for that, this community is blessed and thrives with love. And so it is. So it is. Okay, it's time for our closing song. If you'd like to stand, let's sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now for our benediction, please repeat after me. Something wonderful is happening right now. Something wonderful is happening right now. It's happening in my mind. It's happening in my mind. It's happening in my body. It's happening in my body. It's happening in the body of my affairs. It's happening in the body of my affairs. I think it. I think it. I feel it. And I know no, it. I know. Just the way that it is. And just the way that it is not. Thank you, life. Thank you, life. Have an awesome week, everybody. Blessings. See you next Sunday.